Preston, welcome to Make It Simple. Thank you so much for sitting down to have this conversation with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You know, it's it's something that um, that I wanted to to talk about with you for some time, even before your 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 book Embodied uh, came out. You know, as mm -hmm. as a pastor, I, I am more and more serving serving people who identify as trans or non-binary or genderqueer or or a member of their family, like their their son or daughter is mm -hmm. is now using these terms and kind of identifying in this fashion, and I've found myself on time and again feeling just incredibly um, ill-equipped to talk about it. And, yeah. uh, and, and I know that I'm not, I'm not alone. And so I'm thankful that we get to kind of have this conversation that'll hopefully be helpful uh, to others who, who find themselves trying to understand this better, um, but also yeah. love people uh, more. Um, mm -hmm. and, and yet, as I do, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that I come into this conversation with some, with some heaviness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is, this is a, a sensitive and, and um, complicated conversation. Um, what in your mind makes this conversation so difficult to have? That's a great way to start. And um, before I say anything, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I don't identify as trans. I've never experienced gender dysphoria. Um, and so anything I say is is always going to be incomplete. And whatever I say, uh, hopefully it will be helpful and, and informative on some level, but um, there is no replacement for just sitting down and you know, talking to and listening, genuinely listening to somebody who does identify as trans or, or is experiencing gender dysphoria. So I, I think the difficult, there's several ways I can answer that. I think number one, the topic has been very politicized. And so many people, Christians and non-Christians, when they think of the trans conversation, they often view it through the lens of, you know, well, what did Ben Shapiro say? Or what did CNN say? Or mm -hmm. What's the latest law or trans people in athletics? You know, like we we will typically have this lens that is, you know, it's there. The politicalization is not unimportant, but it, it does represent a really small piece of the much greater conversation. So, I think the where depending on where we're getting our politics from, that can really shape our fear, our anger, our aggression when we even approach the conversation. There's that. And then I think there's just some obvious complexity <laughs> over yeah. the conversation. You know, if somebody says, I feel like I was born in the wrong body or, you know, what does that mean? Is that a true? Um, most of us have a very basic sense that humans are male or female. Um, and now, you know, we're introduced to many different gender identities. And so there can be a lot of initial confusion, confusion over what we're even doing. And thirdly, a lot of us, at least if you're my age or younger, I'm 46, we don't want, we don't want to be a bigot. We don't want to be a so-called so right. transphobe. We want to be loving. We know how the church has done it in the past and we don't want to do that. So we're afraid of saying something offensive or or being on the wrong side of love. Um, and so you add all that together and sometimes we just kind of shut down and just don't engage the conversation at all. So that's, that'd be three big ones. There's probably more than, more than that. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, those, the, those, are the, those are the big ones for me. I think the biggest one for me being, I just don't, I don't wanna hurt people. I, I mm -hmm. wanna help people. I, yeah. I wanna have this conversation. I wanna understand it. I wanna understand people's struggles. I wanna understand how to love people better. I also wanna understand what, what, what the truth is as a, as a Christian, as a pastor. I wanna understand what the truth is. I'm gonna stand on that. But as I do that, I, I, fe I feel like the conversation is rife with potential for me to do more harm than good. That, that's, mm. that's, the sense, yeah. that's the sense I feel. So, so what, what, are, what are some things you've kept in mind as, as, as a person who, who does not identify as trans or non-binary, as a cisgendered white male entering into this yeah. conversation, writing a book about it? What are some things that you've had to keep in mind as you have this conversation in, in a public way and you, you, you try to be as helpful and as loving as possible? The, the biggest one for me as somebody who is academically wired you know, is as I wrestle with these important concepts to make sure I'm keeping people at the front and center of that, of my journey. And that's not always easy, you know, because you'll, you'll read this article, read that book, look at this debate, and, and you could kind of get fired up like, well, no, this is true. And that's wrong. And, and that doesn't always cultivate the best posture when it comes to people. So that's where I, I just constantly um, have to stay in relationship with my friends who are you know, identify as trans or non-binary um, to, to make sure I'm letting their story shape how mm -hmm. I go about this conversation. Um, 
And yeah, I think learning how to ask the right questions too is a big one. What are we even asking? Um, whether we should love trans people? Well, hopefully that's a capital Y, yes. Yeah. Um, whether we should listen to and learn from trans people? Again, that should absolutely be a yes. Um, I think there is, I, I should add this too, since we're at the beginning of the conversation, that we, we need to really come at the trans conversation understanding that LGB is different from T. In other words, mm -hmm. When, we, when we're talking about trans experiences, we're not talking about sexual ethics. We're not talking about same-sex marriage. Like, you know, I, I remember I just talked to a mother a few weeks ago whose son is transitioning and, you know, she was very flustered and, and kind of, you know, just like, just upset and not in an angry sense, but just like, you know, just really taken off guard. And, and then she said, you know, I, 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 I could have sworn my son wasn't gay, you know, and he dated girls and I think it was genuine. And I just, this doesn't make sense. And I said, well, what makes you think he is gay? <laughs> and she said, well, he's transitioning, you know, he's trans. I said, so like, mm -hmm. there's nothing to do with being gay. Like some trans people are straight, some are gay, some are, some non-trans people are gay, gay, some are straight. Like being trans has nothing to do with sexual ethics. In fact, there is no, if we even ask the question, like is being trans sinful? What does that even mean? Like, what does being trans even mean? 10 people, what that means, you might get 11 different answers. So I think there's, yeah, learning how to ask the right questions and not assume that when we talk about trans identities, we're even talking about LGB stuff or sexual ethics. Preston, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I wonder if you have any insight on, um, first of all, like, it just seems like gender identity and trans and this stuff is, it feels like it's everywhere now. It's in our culture. Yeah. Um, for the first time in my life, I have friends that have children that are wrestling with this. Do you have any insight as to like why it seems to be so pervasive in our culture right now or why it's just come up and it's such a, yeah. such a topic? Yeah, there's, so I'm going to, um, to speed up my internet here, I'm going to cancel my uploads. I was uploading some stuff and I think it's bogging us down. Um, I, yeah, there's, there's, there's two quick reasons I could give. Number one, with the federal legalization of same-sex marriage in 2015, a lot of especially older uh, gay and lesbian people who have fought for decades for that, mm -hmm. that was kind of the final goal. And it's like, man, the federal legalization of same-sex marriage, like, and, and I know Christians were all up in arms over that, at least some, some were, um, but look at it from their vantage point. That, that's a huge victory for, yeah. for people who have been fighting for that for years. So after that, a lot of older gay and lesbian people are kind of like, oh, we're good, you know, and it seems like we're being celebrated in most pockets of culture, especially the most dominant areas of influence. Um, not that there is still bullying that happens, but nothing like it was decades ago. And so, so with right. gay and lesbian people, the kind of the activism just was kind of not want to say over, but it was largely kind of it's, it's succeeded that gave way to now um, trans people saying, okay, well, that's great for gay and lesbians. What about our, our mm -hmm. rights? So that would be one reason why in the last now seven years, the trans conversation has taken front, has been front and center, but also there is, let, let me say this, there's almost two different trans conversations. Um, they overlap, but they are actually quite different. There's the older, trans generation um and then there's things going on among gen z mm -hmm. that it, i don't want to say they're in two entirely different conversations they're still mm -hmm. under the broad umbrella of trans but they are very they are quite different there's a lot of differences happening um and without getting too deep in the weeds um older trans people typically grew up experiencing debilitating gender dysphoria mm -hmm. um which is a very, it's a very rare condition. You know, the DSM says it's 0.014% of the population would, would be diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which can be utterly debilitating. You can experience the time you were three years old, two years old even. And for most kids that do experience it, it, it does end up going away after puberty. But for those that it doesn't, it can be a, a, a minute to minute, hour by hour struggle just to put on your shoes in the morning, you know? Mm. Um, and so older trans people went through years of that and years of sometimes mental health therapy. And finally, after a long time of wrestling, they might've pursued transitioning old, you know, as a young adult, sometimes even an older adult. Um, 
that kind of trajectory is is a little bit different than a lot of younger people today. I mean, there's been, I mean, a, to, to say the numbers have skyrocketed would be an understatement. Um, there's, well, to put it specifically, there's been a 5,000% increase among teenage girls identifying as trans in the last 10 years. So, I mean, a yeah. hockey stick spike, uh, that that comes from the UK, but any Western country, there's, there we're seeing an ex, an absolute explosion of young teens identifying as trans or not typically trans it would be non-binary gender queer gender fluid mm -hmm. um and so it has raised a question is there something in the social environment that is playing yeah. some role because for most of these teens uh, most a lot of these teens they didn't grow up experiencing the kind of childhood debilitating gender dysphoria that some older trans people did um, there does seem to be a a a rush that might be a little too strong in some circles it is a rush um toward transitioning cross-sex hormones puberty blockers and so mm -hmm. on um and that's something um is making a lot of people nervous in fact the people who are most nervous about the quickness with which the explosion of teens identifying as non-binary trans and the rush towards transition transitioning the two groups of people that are really nervous about that are lesbians and older trans people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that they're probably for somewhat different reasons, but um, that, so, so I think the social question with younger trans people that that's not, that didn't really exist for older trans people. There was no social like motivation for right. identifying as trans. Like that just, that was not a thing, but in some, it's, if you're in a more progressive environment and I, this, these are, this is a quote from a friend of mine who is now, she identifies trans and detransitioned as a 21 year old. She said, you know, I was a white straight girl, cis girl, and it was bad to be that in my environment. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the kind of persecution and bullying or just negative view of LGBT people that a lot of older LGBT people grew up with. It's almost like in some context that's completely flipped around to where now not being that can be viewed as, well, you're just part of the oppression of, you know, um, sexual and gender minorities and so on. Sure. So there's just a lot of, lot of social complexity that is playing a role in when it comes to young, young people in this conversation. That, sorry, that that's a long answer, but it's no, actually, it's I actually made it brief because <laughs> <laughs> no, it raises lots of questions. I'm sure, sure. it's complicated. Yeah. yeah. So Preston, walk us through, let, let's, let's maybe back up a little bit and and um, uh, define define some terms at least for this conversation. Um, sure. Uh, what what's the relationship in, in your in your view as you present it in embodied your your book? Um, what's what's the relationship between like biological sex and gender? Yeah. First of all, that's the most important question to, for the conversation. Um, I always ask. I always when I talk about this, I always ask people, "How many genders are there?" And the room kind of looks a little nervous, like, "Uh." Pretty sure it's two, but the fact yeah. that you're asking the question makes me wonder. And that's what like, I thought. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Nobody should answer that question. You need to ask a question. What do you mean mm -hmm. by gender? The term gender is used so fluidly today. Um, mm -hmm. Let's quick historical overview. Up until the late 60s, early 70s, sex and gender were used as synonyms. Mm -hmm. It just, whether you're a male or female, and there's two options, male or female. Uh, that's your sex, that's your gender. They were used interchangeably. In the wake of the 70s, though, then you had, uh, you know, the, the concept of gender began to be viewed as a, as a related but somewhat separate thing. The most basic definition of gender, when used in distinction from sex, is the psychological, social, and cultural aspects of being male and female or female. For instance, um, you know, if I said, is pink a girl color or boy color, you know, <laughs> we're going to say, well, it's a girl color, but the color pink has nothing to do with biological sex. Right. It has to do with how the majority of females have tended to maybe dress or whatever in a certain culture at a certain time period. Interestingly, a hundred years ago, pink was considered masculine and blue was considered feminine. If you had a baby girl, you would hundred years ago, you would put her in blue. If you had a baby boy, you put him in pink. But then now for whatever reason, it's, it's flipped. Um, well, that, that 
you know, the, the association of pink with femaleness and blue with maleness, that has to do with gender, this psychological or more specifically the cultural and social aspects of being male or female. If I said, you know, is playing American football masculine or feminine, you would say masculine. Well, again, the sport has nothing to do with biological sex intrinsically. It just has to do with how many, some members of a particular biological sex might, you know, resonate with. So, so there is some people get upset separating sex from gender. And, and I understand that. Um, but there is at least some helpfulness in understanding cultural phenomenon, phenomena that arise around these kind of gender stereotypes and just the raw nature of biological sex. So, so yeah, today, um, so, so gender, okay. And I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll keep it simple. <laughs> It's too late, right? Um, gender can, there's like three subcategories of gender, gender identity, gender roles, and gender expression. Gender expression, how we dress, our mannerisms, our interests. Gender role, how society assumes men and women should act. You know, 50 years ago is like men were the breadwinners, women sit at home, and these are the assumed roles that a male or female would have. And then gender identity, which is the most important for our topic, is one's internal sense of self as male, female, both, or neither. So understanding the difference between gender identity and biological sex is the starting point for understanding the trans conversation. Because many trans identified people would say, okay, I might be biologically male or female, but my gender identity is fill in the blank. I mean, there's dozens, if not hundreds of different mm -hmm. possibilities they can mm -hmm. choose from. And that just refers to their internal sense of self as male, female, both, or neither. And that raises the question of what does that even mean? Is that a legitimate category? Are we just making stuff up? Is it a feeling? And that's yeah. a whole another labyrinth we can wander into. <laughs> well, you know, uh, building off of what you're saying, Preston, you know, it, it seems to me that, that, that culturally we, we're living in a moment where there's this move to say that, that, I, that my identity, this internal reality that I, that I have norms my biology my physical reality that that, yes. that what i feel on the inside is is the is the primary factor of who i am over and above my my physical reality um mm -hmm. and that it's the it's the primary driver in my understanding of self like, like my mm -hmm. internal my internal reality of who i feel that i am um yeah you're a new testament scholar uh, just you know, you're you're reading an understanding of Christian scripture. What's the sense from scripture of 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 when God looks at us, yeah, and he and he talks about who we are, and mm -hmm. he identifies us. What, what what does he see as 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 primary in terms of determining yeah. our identity? Does he look at our um, our self perception internally? Does he look at our mm -hmm. primarily our biology? Is it a mix of both? Like how does mm -hmm. what does he look at when he when he defines yeah. us? First of all, that's a great way of framing it. Um, and the way I've framed it is similar to you is in, in the book, you know, I ask a leading question. If someone's internal sense of who they are conflicts with their biological sex, like they experience some incongruence here, then which one are they? Yeah. Your internal sense of self, is that determined who you are or your biological sex? And I'm a big fan of exhausting all the different arguments on all sides. And, and there is some complexity here, specifically with the relationship between our bodies and our brains, you know? Um, but to save you the five chapters that I, you know, explored that question through, um, yeah, I do think that our, in terms of the categories of male, female, man, woman, boy, girl, that our biological sex objectively determines whether we are a man or a woman, even if our internal sense of self doesn't resonate with that. Now that's a bold, I mean, it should, in some circles that wouldn't be, it'd almost be controversial that I even have to say it, that, you know, it seems so obvious to some people, but in other circles that that's a very, that, that would get stuff thrown at me if I, if I said that. Um, and, and that, that is a very modern, I would say, I mean, not just me, but it's a very modern Western, um, way of saying, or, or it would be a very modern Western way of viewing human nature. If we said the opposite that no, our, my, my internal sense of self determines who I am like that. 
that would conflict with my understanding of a biblical worldview of human nature. Um, in fact, if we go all the way back to Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 1, you know, God created them in his image, God created the male and female, and you see a, 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 an overlap, an association between being created in God's image and being created male and female so that we bear God's image, not just as humans, not just as embodied humans, but specifically as sexed embodied humans. Our male and femaleness, referring to biological sex, is a significant part of human identity, and it's correlated with bearing God's image. So if somebody said, well, it's just my biological sex, or it's just my body, just that kind of flippancy doesn't really reflect a Christian worldview or a Jewish worldview of what it means to be human, what it means to bear God's image. So that, that is, again, a very modern Western um, way of understanding human nature. Um, yeah. 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 Because you know, throughout the Christian narrative, I mean, the, the importance, the beauty, um, uh, the, the divine nature, even in some sense of the physical reality of sure. that ult- because, you know, it starts with a physical reality and it's, it's going to end in a redeemed and yeah. perfected physical reality. Um, the, the, the physical world matters, including mm-hmm. the, the physical body that, that I, that I inhabit, right? That's a, that's mm-hmm. a key, that's a key part of the Christian right. story to the point where God in the Christian story takes on a human body with a right. biological sex, right? And it, God takes on, takes this on. That, that's how much yeah. it matters, right? And Creation, so, resurrection, incarnation in the middle, yeah. like that, that all is an important storyline of scripture that flows from Genesis 127. There's a reason why Jesus is, the most references to the image of God in scripture are referring to Jesus as the ultimate expression of what it means to be human. You know, obviously he was divine, but he was also 100% human. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the goodness and material, material, materiality of, of, of creation and, and being human, that these are all significant themes. Now I, I will say this, um, the way, not just trans people, but people who are, who advocate for certain aspects or certain trans ideologies, I hate collapsing it into one ideology but certainly you know there's variations you know some expressions of that do sound very gnostic you know where it's just Mm -hmm. this body just seems to be a shell that covers the real you that is definitely there i will say that doesn't represent every trans person or even somebody who transitioned you know the, the friends of mine that i know that did have transitioned um man, each story is very complex. Um, one in particular, you know, for her born biologically male and she would still say I I'm biologically male. It's just a scientific fact, but you know, experienced debilitating gender dysphoria, went through every kind of therapy, tried everything, but from her vantage point, after years and years of struggle, um, she was either going to commit suicide because she couldn't stand to wake up another day or, transition and even there she was you know 70 80 percent sure that this is the right thing to do but he wasn't like bold isn't an activist is just saying i'm trying to survive and yeah. the last six years you know after post-transition she's very little depression very little anxiety no more suicidality no more gender dysphoria now that that's not an ethical or theo- what's well, not a theological or philosophical argument but that that is the relational side that's like man while there are some kind of <laughs> proto or neo-gnostic expressions of certain trans ideologies for some it's just a practical i don't know what else to do yeah. um so i think it's important to, that there's yeah. a lot of complexities within the greater conversation yeah and i was yeah, i was thinking of um uh christina beardsley who is a uh, a, a yeah. trans uh a priest, I think, I think in the Anglican church, I, yeah, I know she's in the, yeah. she's in the UK and, uh, you know, hearing, hearing her talk, I get a sense from her that, that, that her transition to, to being a female, to being a woman is, is part of her, she would say it's a part of her high view of her physical self. 
Yeah. That be, because it's about, I, I, I care about my body so much that I want yeah. it to be in congruence with my internal reality. Right. I, I'm not, I'm not seeking to, I didn't transition my physical, my physical self because I have a low view of it. It's because it matters so yeah. much and I have such a high view of it that, that I want to transition yeah. that. So I, so I do think it's important to recognize that, that not, not everyone in this conversation has, as you said, kind of a Gnostic view. I think it's really important to say that there, that yeah. there is, there, there are those who, who can say that they're, they're motivated out of a high view of the physical world. Yeah. To, to, That's to a great, sense. you're the first, first, first person I know to reference Christina Beardley, who I've had conversations with and extremely thoughtful uh, as a yeah. PhD in theology, I believe. Um, and yeah, in her book, she references that that's, it, it's really out of, out of concern for the body that I want it to be congruent with my mind. And, and that, you know, it, I'm a huge fan of not straw man in argument. Like what is, you know, the best, because I do hold the view and I've talked to Christine about this, you know, and she, she really liked my book, except for that part. You know? <laughs> like why, why? I don't understand how you say it's, you know, ethically not permissible to transition from your viewpoint and you know my pushback well i gave reasons for it. it's not like i just pulled that out of my back pocket and just flippantly said it but um uh the the best counter argument is if you believe in something like the fall which we all do as christians or should then could it not be that somebody's brain for instance wasn't as touched by the fall as their body so that their brain is actually a more accurate description of who they are than their body. So that it's out of a high, like you said, a high view of the body that I want my body to align with my brain. Now that assumes that our brains are sexed like our bodies are. And that's why I wrote a whole chapter exploring that um, possibility, which I don't, I don't think brains are sexed dimorphically like the bodies are our bodies are but um yeah at least we can appreciate there there are certain strands of trans ideology there's certain ways in which trans people have reflected on the human body that are, are more thoughtful than others even if i yeah. ultimately would would disagree preston i want to preface this question just again by recognizing that um that I, I am not a trans person, and this is a much easier question for me to ask than it is yeah. for people who live this story to answer. Mm -hmm. So, but 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 I, but I but I but I think it's an important one to ask. You know, we, we talk about the the lack of congruence between my internal reality and my physical reality, and so uh, the the journey that many have chosen to take um, who feel that disconnect is to change the physical reality. Mm -hmm. Why is it that that seems to be the overarching choice that's made? If 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 I there's a disconnect between my internal reality and my physical reality, the way to rectify that is not I don't I don't hear many people at least today talking about well I need to change the internal reality yeah. to make it in alignment with my physical reality. Instead, what we, yeah. we what we the conversation is about changing the physical to match the the yeah. internal. Why 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 is that the path that yeah. we we seem to go? That's a gr another great question. Um, and I think if you ask an older trans person that versus a 15 year old trans non-binary person that you might get two very different answers. Um, one response to that would be, I would be ideologically that some people do believe that their internal sense of self is who they are. And if anything disagrees with that, that needs a change, not their internal sense of self. Um, so, so one, and that would be a primary worldview within a large swath of the medical field that's involved in this conversation, um, where if somebody, you know, s simply says, I am trans, I identify as such and such, then that identity is sacrosanct. It's protected. You don't question that. Like if anybody says they are X, Y, and Z, that is who they are. That, that, that is a very specific worldview that again, I would have problems with serious problems with, but for somebody that has that worldview, that's the starting place. If, if this is who you say you are, you are that. Everything else needs to change. If people don't agree with that identi identity, you need to get rid of those people. Um, if your body disagrees with that, we need to change the body. Everything's kind of like is, is wrong if it doesn't agree with that verbal identity. Um, another reason why people would hold to what you're saying, like why not change the mind, not the body, uh, for some people, they did try for years and years and years, and it just 
yeah. didn't work. Again, I've got friends that went through every form of therapy and this debilitating dysphoria didn't go away. So it's really more through pragmatic reasons, not so much philosophical, but pragmatic saying, I don't know what else to do. I'm being told that transitioning will alleviate my dysphoria and depression and suicidality. I've tried everything else. So therefore I'm just going to do it just for pragmatic reasons. Um, uh, yeah, those are, I guess those would be the two big umbrellas. One would be ideologically and one would be more pragmatically why people would, would hold to that view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, Preston, I've heard you talk about, um, like what you've heard from this community and you spend a lot of time, um, Mm -hmm in relationship with people that uh, largely their experience with Christians or with the church has been unkind or yeah. negative. And so, um, I, you know, how do we, as the church, how do you hold truth and orthodoxy in these things, but just do better? How do we do better? Yeah. yeah. It's a great question. I mean, <laughs> where do I want to start? I, honestly, when it comes to the trans conversation, I don't, I think most Christians, non-trans Christians who might have a problem with the whole trans conversation, if I was to ask them to articulate a solid biblical anthropology, I don't, I don't know if they would be right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's embedded in a lot of our hymns, you know, I'll fly away, sweet Jesus. I can't wait to leave <laughs> the right. shell of the, you know, like That's we right. have <laughs> right. Gnosticism all over the place in the church. That's right. Um, we get surgeries on our body to enhance how we look. I mean, we've, we've, we've got a pretty shallow biblical anthropology in the church. So I, I it's almost like the Romans two, one moment where it's like, who are you to <laughs> That's yeah. almost want to start there? Um, that's a great point. Yeah. I, so I think having that humility that, Hey, there's a lot, there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge that we need to admit. Um, I, I think there is just a tremendous amount of ignorance on the whole trans conversation. Again, it's, we take our cue from our favorite political pundit and that's kind of the depth of our knowledge on the trans conversation. And that's a terrible starting point. Um, So there's a lot of ignorance and ignorance breeds fear, especially in our polarized society Um, to be on, you know, whatever political tribe you're giving your allegiance to. It's like that tribe has a certain view of the whole trans conversation and, those are your talking points. Everything else is kind of the enemy is how this is kind of embedded in how a lot of Christians think. So how do we overcome that? I, you know, I think having a lot more, I think setting aside kind of the stream of knowledge that we're drinking from Mm -hmm. in this conversation, let's just set that aside. Let's be curious about somebody else's experience and their story. Let's ask some good questions rather than get upset at your friends, 15 year old kid who wants to be called they, them, instead, rather than just bleeding with being upset because that's just terrible and wrong and ask the question of why. I mean, genuinely, like if you sat mm-hmm. down out of genuine curiosity and asked this kid uh, with humility, I would love to understand why you want to be called they, them, you know, um, let's start there. doesn't mean you, they may say something that you totally don't agree, don't agree with. That's fine. But like, let's at least start with a, from a place of genuine curiosity so that whatever we might, so that our views are built on truth, not assumptions or straw, straw man kind of arguments, you know, um, that, that alone. I mean, I just, if we just had that posture mixed with sound theological reflection, um, I think that would go a long way. The problem is we have shallow theological reflection and then a whole lot of assumptions that <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we didn't ask somebody, why do you prefer these pronouns or, or whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, well, well, yeah. well, starting, you know, um, I, I agree with, with this kind of posture of curiosity, asking questions, right? Um, mm-hmm. Before you get the chance to ask the question, would, would you, would you suggest that, that people of faith who, you know, who, who say you know who say they hold to an orthodox view of, of human sexuality, gender? Um, uh, should they should they seek to be hospitable to people's preferred pronouns? Yeah, is that, that's is, a good is that is, is that a way to is that an entree into a conversation and yeah. a way to show respect? And is that is that a way to love our neighbor? Or is that make the is that just give in to yeah. what many Christian people see as a problem? That's a great it's a great question. It, it's obviously a hot question. And <laughs> like I'll you know, I wish I had an hour um, to unpack the pros and cons of different views and everything. So let me just say, 
there's really good people on both sides of this. There's good arguments that we all need to wrestle with. Nobody should either say yes, use pronouns or no, don't use pronouns too quickly. Like truly try to understand some of the concerns people have on both sides. Having spent quite a bit of time in that uh, debate dialogue, um, I do land on the side of, for the most part, I, I think I, I do use prone, someone's preferred pronouns. Uh, as a way, you use the phrase hospitable, to meet somebody where they're at, to be hospitable, to, um, to be incarnational. Um, and the biggest pushback is, well, that's, you're lying to them. You're, you're feeding into a, a lie. You're, or the more crass way of putting it, and I don't like the way this is put, but you're, you're encouraging delusion. And that, that word is not helpful at all, but that, that's how it's sometimes framed. Um, I don't, again, if you ask the majority of trans people, um, you know, if I use your pronouns, does that, do you automatically think that I agree with everything you believe? And I've, I've, I've taken informal surveys on this. The overwhelming majority is like, well, no, I, I probably assume you don't agree, but wow, you want to be in a relationship with me and you're willing to honor my pronouns, you know? Um, so I, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily lying and, and language is so flexible. Like if I, and this is a, you know, not a perfect example, but if I invited my British friend to a, a game of football and I show up with shoulder pads and a helmet and he shows up with a, what I would call a soccer ball, soccer ball yeah. <laughs> who's going to give in, you know, it's like there's <laughs> language is complex and it's as i call you know shared social space where two people with different worldviews are coming together and trying to relate to one another sometimes we're going to have to use the language of somebody else's worldview sometimes they might have to give in so when it comes to the trans conversation for most trans people pronouns are a huge deal and if you're not willing to use their pronouns there is no hope of any kind of relationship so as i often say cynically if you don't want any trans people in your life, like you just don't want any trans people in your life, then yeah, don't use their pronouns and you will guarantee no trans person will ever want to be around you. Um, my one exception though, you know, when it comes to parents with younger kids, younger meaning let's just arbitrarily say under 15, I, I think it could be actually healthy for a parent in humility and grace to not use um, the pronouns of the younger kid. Um, it, it, let me let me qualify that. I do think it's a case by case basis, mm -hmm. but for yeah. pronouns are a form of social transitioning. And sometimes if a, if an authoritative figure, a parental figure is affirming that social transitioning that can not always does, but can play a role in nudging them further down the road towards hormonal transitioning, surgical transitioning. Um, and I, as a parent, I want to put the brakes, look, uh, if I was an atheist, a Bible burning atheist, I would still be opposed to teenagers transitioning. I just don't think they have the ability to make a lifelong irreversible decision, especially mm -hmm. given all the social confusion surrounding the conversation. So as a parent, if I, my 12 year old wants to be called they, them, or a different name, again, in grace, humility, understanding, I'm still gonna, in most cases say, love you. I will come alongside you. I'm gonna be here for you, but no, I'm not going to um, use these pronouns. Um, but again, good people will disagree with me on that. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to hear out the alternative view, but well, it's interesting listening to you talk. I'm, I'm thinking, I think I over prioritize. I, I think it's good to wrestle with these things and ask these questions, but mm -hmm. I think I've made it more important what my opinion is. And, and instead of saying like, um, I'm going to come first with my thoughts and my opinions, and I'm going to stand on truth. It's about relationship. And it just, it's like, oh, duh, it yeah. always comes back to like, like relationship. And that's, that's grace. And that's humility. And I don't yeah. want anybody coming at me with my, with my junk first or my, what they believe I've done wrong. And so it's just, it's interesting listening to you. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. we've forgotten with a conversation as sensitive of this, like it's about relationship and there's people behind this that sleep and struggle and, and worry and are dealing with things. So mm -hmm. I appreciate Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. Preston, how, how much conversation, conversation are you yeah. getting? Because, because you are for, yeah. I mean, if our goal as Christians is being an agent of discipleship, um, sorry, did I freeze? Did I, nope. You're back. Am I frozen or am I good? <laughs> no, you're okay. good. Pick, pick back right. up with it, that thought. Okay. If our goal, which it should be since our goal is to be an agent of discipleship, that mm -hmm. the most effective place for being an agent of discipleship oh. is within relationship, within a, a trusting 
um, vulnerable relationship where the person we want to help influence trusts us. They, they know we're committed to them. They know we're genuinely trying to love them. That's the most fertile ground for discipleship. So there's some things that non-trans Christians can do <laughs> to help enter into those spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, refusing to use someone's pronouns typically shuts the door on that. Mm -hmm. And again, they're, they're not to repeat what I said earlier, but I mean, with, with a parent who has already established trust, love, humility, they're listening. Like if all that is in place, they do have a much longer leash, I think, on still parenting their, their kid who, you know, might be in a situation where they're, you know, being brainwashed by a certain ideology that's not just mm -hmm. wrong, but could be destructive. And I, and I do want to, as a parent, want to protect them from the, the dis potential destruction that could happen from walking down a, a, that kind of path. So, um, yeah, it's the pronoun thing's super complicated yeah. and parenting trans identified teenagers is probably the most complex area of the ministry that I've been engaging in for eight years. And I've engaged in pretty complex <laughs> <laughs> situation. Well, well, I mean, that's the, that, that's a perfect segue to, you know, my, my next question for you is, you know, just two days ago, I was having, having a conversation with a friend of mine and, mm -hmm. and, and her, her teenage daughter is now identifying as, as, um, as, as non-binary, um, as being asked to be, um, uh, called by a different name. And, mm -hmm. um, th you know, this, this, this mom just feels really, really caught, caught, um, she, she wants to, to, to love her daughter. She, she doesn't want to lose it. She doesn't want to lose her daughter. Yeah. Um, she is, she's in desperate fear of her daughter. Um, if she does not affirm her, her desire to be, to begin a journey of transitioning towards, towards a, a man that yeah. she's going to lose her daughter in any number of ways that she's going to lose her daughter just in terms of losing the relationship because she doesn't affirm it or uh, worst case scenario, she loses her daughter to, to suicide, self-harm. Um, and, and uh, what I find for her, even though this, the, this mom is a, is a, is a, is a woman of deep and profound and, and mature faith, the, the theological philosophical questions are so far down the ladder. Like they don't, they don't even really matter all that much right now. So much as the question of how in the world do I love my kid? So I don't lose my kid. I just don't want to lose my kid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what, I'm sure you've been confronted with parents like that. Um, a thousand yeah. times over, like, like, what, what do you say when you put, when you put your pastoral heart in, in, yeah. in, in high gear? What, what do you say to the parent who's like, look, I, there's a lot of complexity. I get it. I, I just want to love my kid best. What in the world do I do to love my kid best? It's a great question. And it's, this is the most common, you should see my inbox, like the, this, yeah. your scenario. I know you have a specific scenario, but that scenario yeah, it has been repeated a thousand times over in, in, in just in my life alone. Um, <clears throat> let, let me mention this before I forget. We, my organization, we did create a resource called Parenting LGBTQ Kids. I think that's the website, parentinglgbtq.com. Um, and so it's an 11-part discipleship curriculum. Uh, three specific videos just on the trans conversation, um, parenting trans kids. Um, that we created that because we kept getting so many questions uh, about this. Uh, the desire, I just want to love my kid. I just want to be in relationship with my kid. That's a great, great starting point. If that's their main heart's desire, that's huge. Um, they're not alone. Um, that's another thing to communicate. You are not, you are part of a fairly large community of Christian parents wrestling with very similar situations with their kids that should at least be like, okay, you know, I think that can be comforting. I'm not alone. Um, oftentimes a kid in this situation is going to be told from other sources, from social media, from friend groups, um, from Tumblr, YouTube, um, that if somebody doesn't affirm your identity, 110%, then that person is toxic and you need to cut that person out of your life because they are going to be an agent to increase your suicidality. Parents, if they go to a therapist, it's not uncommon for them to be told, do you want an alive son or a dead daughter? Meaning there's two options here. Encourage your kid to transition or they'll commit suicide, which is among the most irresponsible things a parent could ever be told. Um, but that aside, that is the message that 
people are being told. So I'm going to try to find a way. And I, I don't, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out the, the best response here. The tension I'm going to try to maintain here is to do whatever it takes to be in relationship with my kid, to be seen as trustworthy, to be seen as a safe person, um, to concede things like pronouns. If, if that's what it takes to stay in relationship, then, hey, I'll meet you where you're at. The one place where I am going to draw the line is I, I'm going to do whatever it takes to delay or prevent a teenager from transitioning. And again, that's not, I'm not saying that because I'm a Christian. I'm saying that because the overwhelming scientific psychological data would suggest this is not healthy for humans. So in that sense, I, I want, I still want to, if I truly care about my kid, I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect them from making a decision that is irreversible, that is not going to solve their problems that again, ethics aside, if as an adult, you want to make, once your brain's fully developed <laughs> and you've, you've exhausted all other kind of mental health things, you, you've dealt with your trauma, you've dealt with mental health things, you're wrestling with your depression, your anxiety, and, and you've exhausted all that. And then if as an adult, you still want to make the decision to transition, I, I may, again, I, I, even if I'm not in support of it, I'm going to say, okay, as an adult, you can make the decision. But while you're still under my parental care, I am going to protect you from making what most likely will be a regrettable decision down the road. And this is where, you know, what I don't want is my, you know, and I have several friends who, you know, transitioned and now are detransitioning in their early twenties. I don't want my 24 year old kid to come to me and said, mom, dad, I have no more breasts. My voice is dropped. It's forever going to be deep. I'm forever infertile. I can never have kids of my own because of some decision I made as a 16 year old, where were my caretakers? Mm -hmm. I don't want that moment from that. So I would rather have, again, do everything in my power to meet the kid where they're at, to love them, to be a safe place. But if me saying no to hormones causes my kid to go away, that to me that I'm not going to give on that because there, nobody wins if, if I encourage that you know, from, from happening. So yeah. again, people disagree. Some people say, no, I'm going to do, I'm going to even, I give on the hormones or, or surgical stuff. I'm like, I, that's where I'm going to draw the line that, that as somebody who's has a responsibility to care for my kid, I'm not going to encourage something that I think is, would be a very unloving, uncaring thing to do, even if they demand it. Yeah. You know. Preston, you know, for, for some people right now, their first entree into the, the conversation about um, the, the trans community is with the, the collegiate swimmer, Leah Thomas. And um, mm -hmm. I, I know, you know, you so very wisely at the outset said that we want to, we want to avoid not being led solely by bipartisan and politicized ideas and all this. And certainly Leah's yeah. presence in the swimming pool uh, has been lots of fodder for the partisan yeah. and politicized conversation here. And yet, even earlier this week, as I was talking to people saying that I was going to talk to you, the number yeah. one thing that they said is, <laughs> yeah. ask him about the transgender swimmer. Yes. And so, yes, yes. And, and, and again, I don't want to play into that, but for many people, that's, no, that's, no, really, no. that's yeah. really their entree into this conversation. Sure. Um, and so I, I did just want to like quickly get your thoughts as a person sure. who's a thought leader on this conversation in Christian community yeah. uh, about um, why, why this moment with Leah Thomas seems to stand out for yeah. us culturally and why, why it's, why it's getting traction in the hearts and minds yeah. of people who maybe have overlooked the LGBTQ community before. Uh, yeah. Why is, why does this moment get so much traction and, and, and what should people of faith who are trying to be helpful in all this and loving in all this yeah. say and think about it? Yeah, this is a great, yeah, I've been following the story pretty closely um, when Leah Thomas won the previous swim meet, I think a few weeks ago. And I, and I knew, you know, this weekend, was coming up this last weekend um, and she won the 500 meter. I think what's interesting is she lost the hundred meter came in last place. So the, the people on the political right kind of don't mention that. And people on the political left, I think 
are just doing nothing but spouting off ideology. It, it is a scientific fact that it really is. Like, I, I know I'm not allowed to say that in 2022, you know, but, but it's a scientific fact that if somebody goes through puberty as a male, that increases bone density, muscle math, lung capacity, heart capacity, oxygenation of the blood. So even if they take cross-sex hormones and their level of testosterone has gone down, um, that somebody who's gone through a biological male puberty has a physical advantage, all things considered. Doesn't mean every single male, biological male will beat every single female swimmer, you know, the every single female swimmer in that pool would have kicked my butt and swimming. You know, I'm not, I'm not a swimmer, but all things considered, it, it, there's a reason why feminists and lesbians and just people who are for women's rights are, are, are up in arms. So yeah, I, 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 to, to be very clear, I think absolutely um, things like athletics should be segregated based on biological sex for basic scientific reasons. Um, now, having said that, I, there's the, I, I don't have to say this without being misunderstood, but part of me welcomes what's going on in athletics because it is, it is shining a light mm -hmm. on an unsustainable ideology. Mm. Um, and I, I don't say that negatively. I, 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 again, it's really little to do with Leah Thomas. She's a wonderful person, I'm sure. Um, well, I don't I shouldn't say I'm sure. I don't know her, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but it, it is it, it is shining a light on an unsustainable ideology, and I think it's going to cause a lot of public conversations around this ideology, because you can't say trans women are women and they're the same, and we can't say things like birthing persons rather than women giving birth. We can't all this ideological stuff that seems kind of just outrageous, mm -hmm. the rubber meets the road in athletics. And so for me, it's like, I, I do welcome it. N not because I agree with it, but because I was like, okay, here's where this ideology is gonna, gonna head. So let's have this conversation. If we want sports to be just however you identify, then yeah, males are gonna be just dominated once again. <laughs> do we want that kind of patriarchal right. <laughs> system? Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't think we do. So it's hard to be a genuine feminist and somebody who embraces every aspect of certain trans ideologies as well regarding human nature. And that has nothing to do with the goodness or badness of individual persons. It's the, it's, it's whether a certain way of living in God's creation is going to be helpful or unhelpful for society so um what do you th is that does that make sense i mean i i um oh. so i yeah. yeah yeah i mean it makes and, and um i i completely agree it makes it makes total sense and, and I, I i'm with you i i i welcome the conversation that it brings i just i just um i think we have to have it uh, yeah I, I know we have to have it i i think the, the the part of me that cringes is how we mean you know yeah. people in my position you know people of faith who have uh, a little bit of influence, at least over their own congregation, Christians in general, I cringe at how we have that conversation. Yeah. And that's why one of the reasons I'm so helpful for your work, because like at every turn, you, 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 you make the point to say, we need to have this conversation. But remember, we're talking about real people, real people, real yeah. people, yeah, not only, yeah. not only like Leah Thomas is a real person, but the, the person who's overhearing you, who is struggling to understand who right. they are is a real person in the room too. And right. so how we talk about this, the, the posture we take, the tenor we have, the questions we ask that we, that we make clear to the world are, are of most importance to right. us really matter because we're either communicating love and grace and the goodness of God, or we are not right. in, in how we have these yeah. conversations. And that, that's just so critical. Yeah. And let, let me add this too. It's really important for people to understand for every one biological male who is entering into female sports, you know, female only sports for every one, there, there might be 500 maybe a thousand trans people, some of whom are suffering from debilitating dysphoria or suicidal who are under our care, who have received nothing but mockery and shame from yeah. the church. So, and this, this is, this is, goes back to my first point when I said, let's not read this whole conversation through these kind of clickbait news le mm -hmm. lenses. I, I'm not saying that those clickbait situations, Leo Thomas and others aren't real, aren't important. I think they're, they're very, very important for, 
the conversation as a whole. But if that's our only, if all we do is preach a sermon saying, you know, denouncing this kind of thing, there's tons of people that are going to be caught in the middle saying, I don't, I, I know lots of trans people who wouldn't even agree with that. They're like, no way a trans person should be allowed to be in, you know, uh, the, the, the sports world that's, you know, opposite their biological sex. So <laughs> Um, if all we do is think that this represents kind of the trans movement and then we attack it, sure. a lot of people are going to feel attacked when they're not, that's not even who they, they are. Yeah. So that, that's, it's important to keep that tension in mind, not to diminish how that, that one person out of 500 is, this is, this does bring up an important aspect of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Um, as we kind of finish up here, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Um, if there is somebody who is trans or non-binary listening, what would you say to them as they wonder, like, what is there a place for them in the church or what, what would you say? Man, but I, uh, I, I, first of all, I want to say, what's your name? You know, like each person's got a <laughs> story. Who are you? Um, cause I, I, I can't make any assumptions about what mm. they need to hear, but we, we, we all need to hear, you know, God, God loves you. God values you. Um, you're not a mistake. Um, I'm sorry for any kind of shame and dehumanization you've experienced from Christians. Um, sometimes Christians are very intentional and very mean. Other times they are unintentional. They say things that are hurtful, but it's, it is unintentional. Sure. Uh, I talk to Christians all the time that have huge hearts that would love to buy you a meal and get to know you, but they still might say things that will be offensive. Not just largely out of ignorance, you know? Um, so there's still hope for the church. Um, uh, I, I would also say, I mean, um, uh, the, the people that I know that are, that do identify as non-binary, they, they have a really hard, pro a hard time with rigid gender stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they don't resonate with you know, if you're biologically female, you don't resonate with femininity. You don't want to run around in a pink dress and pigtails. And, and I just want to say, look, the creator, God, the God who wrote the Bible could care less what color you dress in. You want to cut your hair short, long, dye it blue, dye it purple. I got, God does not care. He loves you as a human being. Um, and you don't need to be stuffed in some cultural driven stereotype and and that, that and i think if you're listening and you're non-binary you probably agree with that i want to say the bible agrees with that the bible mm -hmm. gives us a lot of freedom and how to express ourselves in terms of how we dress the interests we have so um yeah that that's uh it, it might be christian culture who might that might feel oppressive but it's not the christian god or the christian bible that is a thing doing the, the oppressing. If, if you do feel kind of some oppression from these artificial gender stereotypes. Preston, thanks so much for having this conversation with us. I, I really appreciate the time. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks you guys. Thank you.